Get a Book Dot today presents Strike Battleship Argent, Book One in the Starships at War series by Shane Lachlan Black, copyright 2016. Stand by for action. Want new bonus chapters? Of course! Everyone wants bonus chapters! If you like what you see in here, give us a super thanks. Buttons are below every video. Every super thanks goes directly to new science fiction. Don't miss our action premieres where you can enjoy the story live. Want to rank up and get special recognition? Become a channel member. You might even become an honorary Skywatch Marine. Join us, subscribe, hit the notification bell, like and comment, and don't forget to visit the bookstore where you will find my latest books and one-of-a-kind officially licensed gear. All ahead, battle speed! Chapter 26 There's no way this many things can go this wrong this quickly, Commander Jace Hunter grumbled. She strode quickly through the nearly empty corridors of Survey Station 19, located at the extreme western edge of the Gitan asteroid field. Her battle group was only a few hours out from its rendezvous with her brother's battleship, but the readings from one of her group's frigates left her with no option but to stop and confirm the data. With her was her XO, Lieutenant Commander Tom Huggins, and several lower-ranking signals analysis officers representing some of her escort ships. We've never seen cloak warnings like this. It's almost like they're using some kind of technology we haven't seen yet. We're still getting gravitics from the main body reported by our probes, but if the Ajax is right... Tom, if the Ajax is right, we're about to jump into the biggest open space battle since the Praetorian campaign. Amy, did you correlate the readings with signals and astrometrics? Yes, ma'am. Lieutenant Sutherland replied, I have all the readings in this portable unit. I need about 15 minutes with the station's tracking logs to confirm. If we're right, we can track the last known positions of the unusual readings and be ready when the cloaked formation makes its move. Outstanding, Jace replied as her team rounded the corner. Two Marines were guarding the door to the astrometrics record storage. Open the door, Corporal, she said impatiently. I'm sorry, ma'am. Access to record storage must be authorized by the station commander. Commander Huggins interrupted. We already checked. The best we could come up with was the approach officer. Apparently, there's nobody in charge out here except a couple of accountants and a guy with a flashlight. Corporal. Hunter's expression made it clear she wasn't in much of a mood for litigation. Ma'am, I'm sorry, but I have my orders. Corporal, can you identify my rank insignia? The Fury Skipper borrowed Lieutenant Sutherland's tablet device and started looking up the emergency regulations. Yes, ma'am. And what rank is that, Marine? You wear the insignia of a Skywatch commander, ma'am. And the opposite device? The Corporal hesitated. Tom gave him two extra moments and then cut in. That's the badge of a task force commander, Corporal. The Marine swallowed trying to emphasize his regulation-perfect attention posture. Somewhere in his adrenaline-hazy memory, he recalled the qualifications for that particularly rare designation. The star-spangled gold insignia would be hard to find on a command officer two ranks higher. Nevertheless, here she was. Judging by the numerous tightly-packed pips, there were at least nine ships, including two ships of the line under her flag. The difference in firepower between a marine sentry armed with a blaster rifle and this slender young woman was roughly the difference between an underfed earthworm and an angry Bengal tiger. How many rank insignia is that, Marine? Hunter asked, still scrolling through the regulations on her tablet. Three, ma'am. Hunter stepped forward until she was nose to chin with the taller Marine. That's right. That means I'm so close to being a captain I can smell that fourth insignia. Now you either open that lab and let my people in there, or I'll snap you back so hard your hair will change color. Do you read me, Marine? Her voice had that tone particular to officers with experience leading thousands of men and women in battle. The sentry Marine correctly recognized his authority, whatever its justification, was not going to successfully compare. He could only imagine the cosmic levels of hell someone roughly 600 ranks higher could rain down on his life. 
The images of ten-foot-tall admirals and courts martial crawled out of his blackest fears before he finally decided to favor discretion over valor. It was one thing to bravely charge the enemy. It was another to choose to die on a hill targeted by an entire artillery division with nothing but a time card punched by a junior lieutenant for protection. Jace watched impatiently as her signal specialists unpacked their gear in the records lab. Commander Huggins stood nearby. Last thing I need today is a lengthy debate with some rifle-lugging grunt over who is allowed where, Hunter muttered. After this is over, I'll tow this entire station back to Core 10 and drop it in a box. When we find out who abandoned their post out here, I think you'll have a hide to go with that tow job, Huggins replied. Hunter to Fury, report all contacts. Fury, Mallory, and CIC, ma'am, no contacts except King 1, bearings unchanged. Very well. We're in the records lab. We should have some answers shortly. Stand by. Affirmative, Skipper. Standing by. Hunter to Echo. Hi, Jace. Isn't this station the coolest? Tom smiled. Commander Hunter's self-built team of miniature robots all had the personalities of children between the ages of about four and seven. Despite the fact none of them were larger than a gallon bottle of milk, as a group they were a surprisingly effective outfit, capable of acting on their own up to a point. Echo was their combination early warning alarm and medical unit. Yeah, it's pretty neat. Are Rebel and Butterfly with you? Uh-huh. Do you want to talk to them? Not right now. Keep me advised. If you get any weird readings, you make sure to tell Rebel and Butterfly first and then tell me, okay? Okay, Jace. See ya. Sutherland and the other officers were well into their work by now. And Do you always bring your robots with you on landing missions, ma'am? Amy asked. She certainly does, Lieutenant. Tom was examining a large map of Gitan's space behind the records consoles. I'll never get over fleet officers who ask why you travel with a group of remote-controlled toy cars and aircraft, he said. Always a source of entertainment when we drop in at Scaries. I've been dealing with raised eyebrows since cybernetic school, Hunter replied. High-ranking officers have a bad habit of not checking the records before they start barking at us. I learned my lesson in a hurry, Tom said. After I found out both Rebel and Wave had been nominated for Valor Awards and that Echo has an Indian Forks campaign ribbon, I've been earning a fortune making odds on the next Admiral to step in it. Ma'am? The task force Perseus officers gathered around Sutherland's console. She had called up the historical records gathered by the many sensors and scanners. Station 19 had been operating continuously for many weeks. There, Tom said, pointing at a spike in the electromagnetic signatures at System's Edge, those are the same readings we got from Ajax. And right here are the readings that confirm it, Jace added. Those anomalous data sets are following a lateral line. Station 19 has been tracking them for over a month. There aren't 16 ships out there. There's more like 40 ships, and some of those power plants are our designs. Why would Skywatch ships be cloaked on the far edge of Gitan? We don't have any bases or space lanes this far out, Tom said. If I didn't know better, I'd say that's a... Hunter keyed her comlink. Fury, this is Hunter. Bring fleet up on the Z-Pack and patch it to my personal designator. Affirmative, Commander. You're on. Hunter to fleet. Set emergency condition three. Stand by battle stations. As the acknowledgments poured in, Hunter switched channels. Mallory, replot our course to rendezvous with Argent and prepare for departure. What's on your mind, Skipper? That's an interdiction formation, and they're not prepping a defense. That fleet is massing for an attack on someone or something, and I'm betting it's populated core worlds. Skywatch would have to muster our entire strength on this side of Boomtown to match that kind of firepower. How could they keep this off everyone's radar this long? Tom asked. Unknown, but I can guarantee you we're going to pull the really loud fire alarm in the hall in about 20 minutes. Chapter 27 Echo rolled about in the station cafeteria and then down the long corridor. All her short-range scanners and sensors were on maximum gain, looking for anything unusual on the virtually abandoned station. There was a brief moment of excitement when she came across a maintenance crew member doing inventory on cleaning supplies— but he was wearing a proper fleet ID badge, 
so she said hello and moved on. The little vehicle's onboard sensor suite had an audio component which continued beeping softly as she travelled from place to place. If those watching didn't know better, they would think she was a toy ambulance or truck of some kind. Until they heard the beeping and the sing-songy humming, she sounded like a girl of about five dressing up her stuffed animals for a pretend tea party. What made Echo particularly dangerous to potential enemies was the fact she was patched into the task force command net and had the same authority as Commander Hunter to sound general alerts, activate the threat board, engage security protocols, and so forth. On more than one occasion, Echo had been the difference between a prepared crew and a lot of casualties. She had been engaged in a long-running conversation with Butterfly about whether pink or yellow was a prettier color, and just for fun, she had kept her audio patch open so anyone nearby could hear both sides of the discussion. Those sounds were just confusing enough that Echo saw the intruders before they saw her. There were five of them. They were heavily armed, and they had no identifying signals of any kind. In fact, Echo's onboard radar tried to ping their location for range and got no signal back. There was a brief, soundless moment as the little vehicle looked up at the darkly dressed humanoids, and they looked back at her. And then all hell broke loose. Emergency, emergency, intruders, requesting assistance, SOS, survey station 19, deck 6, mayday, mayday, sound the alarm, the British are coming. Echo lit up like a pachinko machine. Her strobes, spinning lights, flashers, power loss lights, threat indicators, targeting lasers, and tiny little red light bars went into full operation. She looked like the ground floor of a casino on wheels. Red alert! Battle stations! Code 3! Abandon ship! Evacuate! Keep your hands and arms inside the vehicle! Man overboard! As the torrent of high-pitched panicked noise poured from the little vehicle, she peeled backwards with a startling rate of acceleration, turned sharply and roared back down the corridor at an unsettling speed. After a few more seconds, a full-power ambulance siren went off and mixed with her chattering alerts. The most annoying car alarm ever invented would have literally deflated if put up against the storm of sound Echo produced. Her voice was audible all the way up and down the curved corridor, reflecting off the metal surfaces and making it sound like she was running into a canyon. She definitely lived up to her namesake. Two of the unidentified intruders gave chase, only to find another vehicle parked right in the center of the corridor and blocking their path. This one looked like a camouflaged gas can on tank tracks. It was pointing a non-trivial-looking gun of some kind at them. Identify yourself, it shouted. The voice was that of about a seven-year-old boy trying to start an after-school fight. You better listen, because Echo already said you were intruders. One of the men made the mistake of pointing a weapon at Rebel. His first shot ricocheted off of the tiny tank's shields. The little armored unit returned fire. The painfully bright blast tore a six-foot gash in the ceiling fixtures. Ripped and blasted metal clanged on the floor. Sparks rained down as the corridor lights flashed and strobed, then went out. The two intruders fired wildly in Rebel's direction and quickly retreated. The little tank gave chase. It was basically an iguana pursuing racehorses, but Rebel did his best. Butterfly! Butterfly! Where are you? A small helicopter fluttered into the corridor just as Echo screamed past, lights still flashing brightly enough to illuminate the corridor for ten feet in all directions. Where did you go? Butterfly said softly, pivoting around and flying back into the medical lab just as Echo came roaring back out. Butterfly, where are you? Echo skidded out the door, swerved, and continued down the hall, shouting for her friend, sirens blaring. I'm here, Echo. I'm here. Finally, after a couple more near misses, the two little craft found each other. Butterfly, we have to tell AC. There's intruders, and they're wearing all black clothes, and they have guns, and they're not supposed to be here because AC said nobody except people with fleet IDs are supposed to be on the station, and we gotta... If Echo weren't built on wheels, she would have been jumping up and down while shouting, Echo, I can't understand you when you talk so fast. Do you remember the code for AC's designator? Uh-huh. Echo sounded like she had just run the length of a football field. Okay, then can't we use that code to call her for help? Uh-huh. Okay, then why don't we do that? She can help us.
Okay. Echo was operating on a completely different energy and panic level than Butterfly was. The little helicopter was far less excitable, but was also far more likely to fly somewhere and hide rather than get involved in the action. AC, AC, it's Echo. Remember when you said to call you for help when there was trouble? It would later be viewed as fortunate that Echo had engaged the fleet-wide emergency channel. Her transmissions sounded in the pickups of nine signals officers and the entire landing party at once. Echo, this is AC. Go ahead. Intruders on deck six. Rebels shot them, and I sounded all my alarms, even the really loud ones. And then Butterfly said we should call you and... Okay, Echo, calm down. You did fine. We received your alert. Hunter said reassuringly. Then everything's okay? Echo asked. Are you okay? Do you need help? Butterfly and me will come help you if you need help. No, Echo, we're fine. Go to alert condition four. Can you do that for me? Okay. Then what I need you to do right now is monitor the intership and tell me if any of our signals officers calls. Can you and Butterfly do that for me together? Okay, we'll tell you if anyone calls. Affirmative, Echo. Hunter out. The other officers stared at their skipper. They had never heard someone reassure a robot before. She gets... excited, Hunter said. Tom, raise the Exeter and use her command codes to transmit Echo's tactical data. I want a marine shock platoon with Echo's targets down here in 60 seconds. A small metal object rolled into the records lab. Grenade! Commander Huggins grabbed Hunter and dove towards the mainframe cage. A violent explosion shook the entire deck. Chapter 28 Jason, I'm being serious here. You took a hard crack to the head. I want you to take it easy. I know how you get when you get wound up. Captain Hunter knew that look. Honora Doverley was a doctor first and an executive officer second. If she weren't here doing her duty, she would be running a small pediatric practice in a farming village somewhere and giving away toys and candy to her patients. Promise me, she said, her eyes sincere. I promise, Doctor. Hunter winked. I'll keep it tamped down to a medium-sized dinosaur fight. His grin and infectious confidence made it very hard to doubt him. I suppose that's the best I can hope for under the circumstances. Hunter and Doverley walked onto the bridge while the captain read the status report. So the Highlanders are launched and standing by? Affirmative. Hatch's recommendation was the correct one. Both Wildcat squadrons are on CSP. I have a Yellow Jacket Strike Force standing by off Flight 1 and a T-Hawk Strike Force standing by off Flight 2. Both are on a 15-minute ready alert. I'm going to leave the ground force's loadouts to the colonel, but we'll have plenty of firepower in the air when they hit dirt. The new railcasters did well, I'm told, Jason muttered, scrolling through the damage reports. They pack quite a punch in their energy configurations. Yili tells me the projectiles are even more effective at shorter ranges, Honora replied as she manned the exo station. I practically had to have her restrained in sickbay. She'll be back on her feet about the time Zoni and Moo have recovered, if she doesn't sneak out a ventilation duct first. Hunter sat in the center chair and finished up the report, looking for anything unusual enough to change his plans. Satisfied he knew what he needed to know for now, he stowed the tablet and sighed, examining the tactical track displayed on the Argent's main screen for any new information. We're here, they're there. Nothing has changed in the last ten minutes? Negative, sir, Pilot McInerney replied. Although Nemesis 8 reports there are readings indicating another spotter ship has apparently relieved Kilo X-Ray 2 while they recover their boats. But we were right, Doverly interrupted. That sentinel gun on Barker's asteroid took a shot at us. It was only one shot, but it was enough to almost collapse our starboard point battle screen. We're working on the theory they don't have a full power structure down there yet, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if that's what they're buying time for— once that thing is fully operational, it can lob rounds at us for days before we can fight our way through that minefield to stop it. Hunter swiveled in his chair. Tell me if I'm wrong, Doctor, but can't a nemesis and a couple of paladins lash up and work as a minesweeper? Honora took her headset off and placed it back on the console. It wouldn't be the first time that's been tried with a battleship squadron, but it's dangerous. 
If a skirmisher suddenly pops up in that field with the transponder matrix, they can run and gun the mine team to pieces before they get out of the hot zone. I bet Zoni could beat that strategy, Hunter replied. Just having the friendly transponders for the minefield doesn't give them total protection from a false positive. Agreed, but you're not reckless enough to fly your signals officer into that junkyard, Captain. It sounds like a great way to pull off an epic riposte, but one thing goes wrong and your plan literally goes up like a breached fusion bottle. Hunter frowned at the tactical display. All right, what if we brute force it? Three waves of proximity warheads, maximum spreads. Blow the whole thing to slag? The minute we open up, that fleet will walk over here and button us up like an overstarched dry cleaning order. With all due respect, ma'am, why haven't they done that yet? McInerney asked from the helm. What are they waiting for? No reason to risk the hardware yet, Hunter replied. The longer this standoff continues, the more time they have to energize that gun. Once they have that, they've got a nearly impregnable interdiction zone. Anything that tries to breach the minefield gets carved up by the Sentinel. Everything on the Raleo side of the gun becomes their base of operations. They can launch strikes against every core system within a light year and always have a safe place to run if things get hairy. They'll hit the jump gate first, Anora added. Once that's secured, they've got every tactical advantage and a way to close up everything coming to stop them. Why can't we just go around, sir? Lieutenant Rollins piped up. Can't we just drop the Z-axis and fly under it? Yes, Lieutenant. Every young Skywatch officer comes up with the same genius plan at some point in their career, Anora replied with a smile. But all those plans presume your enemy will continue to operate in two dimensions while you operate in three. It sounds good in a classroom, but in practice, by the time you realize your brilliant plan nobody else ever thought of didn't work, you're floating home, Hunter concluded, looking over at Rollins with a reassuring expression. That gun can fire in any direction we can fly, and we can't leave it here for the next ship to discover suddenly. The challenge here is getting to Barker's asteroid without tipping off the fleet we're sweeping out their mines and without putting our sweepers at risk of being picked off by skirmishers. That's the puzzle, all right, Honora replied, and the clock is ticking on that sentinel. Sir, we're being hailed by Nemesis 8, the acting signals officer reported. Put them on speakers. The channel clicked over. Argent Hunter here. Sir, we have a reactor signature pattern match on the new contact near the location of Kilo X-Ray 2, designated Mockingbird 80. You left standing orders to report on any registry matches. What's she look like? It's the Dunkirk, sir. Hunter raised his eyebrows. The Admiral's ship? How certain are you? Five decimal places. She's running a first-generation fusion-slash-fission combination power design with the old gas-operated valves. Makes more spectrometry noise than a busted chainsaw. Hunter turned to Honora with a wide-eyed look of discovery, astonishment, and certainty on his face. What? You know what that ship has that we don't? Hunter asked with a sly grin. Honora realized it moments later. A mine-friendly transponder! Hunter pointed at the doctor and made a fist. Rollins, you have the con. Doctor, you're with me. The captain and XO strode off the bridge. Where to? Sickbay, Zoni is about to win this war and we're going to do it while eating a sandwich. Chapter 29. Exeter to landing party, come in. The bridge crew of the heaviest destroyer in the Perseus Task Force formation looked at each other with stark eyes as they waited for a response. Their signals officer keyed the intership again. Exeter to landing party. Commander Hunter, come in, please. They're not answering. Something's wrong. First we got that fleet-wide from Echo, and then nothing, Lieutenant Hawkins urged. We need to raise the fury and investigate. What we need to do, Lieutenant, is follow protocol. Force Command has us at Emergency Condition 3, which puts Fury's skipper in charge of any further action. Our job is to wait for orders. Third Officer Pierce replied. If we start going off on our own, all that's going to do is make us start bumping into one another and cause confusion. Echo reported intruders. That robot would sound general quarters if a small dog walked into the mess hall and stole a piece of bacon, Petty Officer Grant replied, causing a couple members of the bridge crew to crack smiles. 
It probably saw someone sweeping up and thought they were trying to take over the quadrant. You're hilarious, petty officer. Check your regs. Perseus has Echo authorized to issue alerts by order of the commander herself. But Echo didn't issue an alert, Lieutenant, Pierce replied with a sigh. It reported intruders to the landing party, which is probably trying to figure out if we're about to send three million tons of starships after two guys and a mop. Then why doesn't the landing party answer? The skipper is probably getting ready to board us and deliver a swift kick to somebody's backside for chatter on the emergency channel. The only officer authorized to speak for Task Force Perseus right now is the force commander on the bridge of DSS Fury. Our job is to keep our mouths shut and stop dreaming up phantom threats so when the time does come, we'll be ready. Sir? That will be all, Lieutenant. The look on Pierce's face told Hawkins the matter was closed as far as the bridge crew was concerned. Aye, sir, she said as professionally as she could before turning and stalking off the bridge. The Exeter was officially designated a war destroyer. She was a Thunderbird-class hull with heavier armor, short-range weaponry, and most importantly, most of the task force's marine strength in the form of a full company of shock troops. The Exeter was the only ship under Hunter's flag capable of launching additional warships into action. She had a small but capable flight deck with four tough little assault transports on a rotating 30-minute alert. The reality of the situation in Skywatch was that Fleet followed the book almost to a fault. Pierce couldn't be blamed for following orders, but there were times when a leader needed to go with intuition instead of waiting for signatures from three flag officers and a legislative resolution. Hawkins believed this was one of those times. She knew most of the Perseus crews tolerated Echo and Jace's robot hobby to a point, but she also knew they didn't ascribe much credibility to the excitable little vehicles and their childlike personalities. Then again, there were only a handful of people in the task force who had ever seen Hunter's bots in any kind of real action. Hawkins was one of them, and she knew there was another currently supervising deployment drills with First Marines on Deck 4. The other reality of the situation in Skywatch was, while Marines followed the book, they were far more likely to at least listen to alternatives. This was especially true if it meant getting the drop on a hidden enemy before they showed up in the wrong place at the wrong time. As far as Lieutenant J.G. Brittany Hawkins was concerned, this was shaping up to be one of those times. Chapter 30 Rebel, I'm Scared the mini-robot summit had convened on Deck 5, not far from where the small tank had broken off pursuit of the two intruders after a short chase. We lost contact with Lieutenant Sutherland's comlink transponder, Butterfly added as she hovered overhead. It must be broken. See? Butterfly thinks so too. We should go help, Echo said. We should get Wave and Lunar too, cause they're good at stuff like this. Comlinks can't get broken unless something is wrong. AC's orders were to monitor the intership and go to alert condition 4, and that's what we did. So we did good, Rebel said proudly. The nod at the end was implied. Yeah, but we tried to call AC and she didn't call us back, Echo exclaimed. We should go see. AC always calls us back. Even when we bother her in the middle of the night with stuff, she still calls us back. Dudes and dudettes, a miniature half-track vehicle rolled up and parked in front of Rebel and Echo. Blessings to the brethren and awesomeness to all. Wave is here and the party can begin. Hi, Wave. Hi, Lunar, Echo said cheerily. I wish things were better. I think Echo is right. We should go find the bad guys and blast them, Lunar said. The rocket-shaped miniature spacecraft hovered overhead facing Butterfly. His high-tech weapons and freshly painted hull gleamed. Are you sure? We should be careful and be sure before we start blasting people. We should ask AC first, Butterfly replied. What if we blast the wrong people? I'm the biggest robot and I get to say, Rebel said with a tone of finality. The other robots waited while the tank thought it over. And I say we go find the bad guys and blast them. Righteous, Wave said. If he had hands, he would have high-fived the fat little tank. Echo, let's go. The tiny half-track turned and backed up a couple of feet, lowering a ramp. Echo rolled aboard Wave's vehicle bed and the little gate closed behind her. Last one there has to build the fire for marshmallows. Wave and Echo led the way. Butterfly extended her heavy lift harness down and energized its magnetic assembly. It clamped against the sides of Rebel's heavy armor jacket and bolted itself into place. She revved her little engines. 
Her rotors increased rotational speed, and she picked the sturdy little tank up off the floor. Air transport was always preferable to the entire group waiting for Rebel's relatively ponderous top ground speed of what Wave once described as slower than January molasses. Echo, use all your little gizmos and be sure nobody is following us, Lunar said as he floated forward and hovered into formation with Butterfly as her wing. If you see a bad guy, tell me who to zap. Okay, the little ambulance replied as she activated her ground survey scanners and sophisticated radar. AC's bots rolled and flew in a compact little formation down the Deck 5 corridor towards the records lab. Chapter 31 How many power-armored marines can we fit in a T-Hawk? Lieutenant Colonel Moody looked up at Captain Hunter as if he had just asked about putting twelve men into a field goal formation. Well, there's room for a crew of five, sir. I... No, no. I want to pack them in. Shoulder to shoulder, how many can we cram in there? Maybe ten or so. Why a T-Hawk? Why not a Paladin? The heavies have deployment tethers for ground troops. N because I want that cruiser to think we're coming out there to shoot at them, not board them. You're flying out there wide open? Sir, we can lash up a nemesis and fly in cloaked. I don't want to fly in cloaked. I want to fly in there with a gun pointed at their head. I want them to be worrying about whether to shoot us with Argent backing us up with her big guns. Before we get out there, XO will go weapons active. By the time they get through their fight-or-flight hesitation, we'll be tapping on the window. That's an awfully big risk, Cap, Moo replied. Agreed, Colonel. If it pays off, we'll have that ship intact and under our command so fast they won't know what hit them. I'd take a bigger force if I were up against a true enemy vessel, but Dunkirk is friendly. Yili can flip a few switches and have us in control in a matter of seconds if we give her the chance. Dr. Doverly was busy reviving Zoni. It seemed the sedatives had done their job. Despite the pouty signals officer's protestations, she really had finally gotten some rest. Zoni, how are you feeling? She looked groggy. What? Doctor, is everything okay? Hunter joined Doverly next to Zoni's bed. You look like hell, Lieutenant, he said. Zoni smiled weakly. Just give me a radio and a frequency, sir. That's good to hear. We're lifting off in fifteen minutes. Where to, Skipper? The Dunkirk is out there, and I want her captured. Even if we can't take the Admiral into custody, she's got technology we need to defeat that minefield. I'm taking you, the Colonel, and Yili with me. We're going to commandeer that vessel and drill a hole through that minefield so the Highlander Paladins can bomb the Sentinel emplacement. Are you sure we can do all that with one ship? I can't, but you and Yili can. Moo and I will be there with a marine boarding party to handle any overzealous enemy defenders. Hunter left the colonel and Zoni to contemplate his plans and stepped into the corridor outside sickbay with Honora. I'm leaving you in command of the Argent XO. They're in no better shape than you are, Jason. Understood. But we may only get one shot at this. Just tell me they're patched up enough for an hour's worth of action. If I pump them full of stimulants and painkillers, barely. It'll have to do. Maintain CSP in position until we have the Dunkirk under our flag. Affirmative. We'll mind the store. Anything more from Atwell and the belligerents from Deck 34? The intruders are still under from the knockout gas. Atwell has been reclining on a slab of dense plastiform in his cell since his apprehension. Hasn't said a word. He knows what we need to know, Hunter muttered. He's going to tell me why Admiral Hughes is involved in all this, and he's going to tell me what's aboard the Dunkirk before the launch. I admire your confidence, Captain, but he's not talking. He doesn't know we're about to take over his precious ship, Doctor, Hunter said, as he stalked towards the brig. In fact, for all he knows, we already took it. Notify Flight 3. I want two Wildcats and a T-Hawk prepped for launch, and I want ten of the nastiest from Dog Block, armored, powered, locked, and loaded in fifteen minutes. Acknowledged! Doverly watched as Hunter descended the ladder to Deck 8. Chapter 32 Another impact shook the records lab. Spark showered and the backlit consoles flickered dangerously again. Commander Huggins ducked away as flashes of weapons fire strobed in the corridor outside. He was cradling a broken arm and holding an exhausted blaster pistol in his other hand. 
eight hostels, maybe ten. Jace Hunter worked madly to stabilize the Constellation's signals analyst. He was unconscious and bleeding from two catastrophic shrapnel wounds. The standard medikit from the lab's emergency supplies was useful, but Jace knew if he didn't get the attention of a trauma unit within the next twenty minutes, he wasn't going to make it. Tom lunged into the hall and sprayed rapid-fire plasma bolts in the general direction of their attackers. A secondary explosion caused the floor to lurch, and a wave of acrid smoke drifted back into the lab. The Fury's XO took the opportunity to drag one of the unconscious Marine guards back into the lab to safety. Lieutenant Sutherland was barely conscious. Her uniform had enormous chemical burns along one side. The advanced fabric narrowly saved her skin from being incinerated in the blast. We were pretty lucky, eh, ma'am? Hunter continued working furiously. Only because this room is packed with gear and consoles, Lieutenant. If that center unit hadn't been here, we'd all be strumming harps right now. Jace pulled out her handheld comm unit. If I give you this, do you think you can figure out why we're off the air? I'll do my best, ma'am. Outstanding. The commander handed the young signals officer the device and finished her work on the other wounded man. That will have to do until we can get a medical team down here. He doesn't look too good, ma'am, Amy said. In about fifteen minutes, he's going to look a lot worse. Get us back on the air, Lieutenant. Jay slapped the woman's good shoulder to encourage her. I. Hunter moved quickly across the lab and retrieved the TK-40 rifle from the unconscious corporal she had threatened earlier. She put her hand to his forehead. Up to now, she hadn't been aware of just how young he was. She paused for a moment to think a good thought, and then she performed a quick field evaluation of his weapon. It was in perfect working order with a full charge. Now we can hit back, she thought. She joined her exo at the door. What's the situation out there? They've got heavy rifles and they're moving up along the reinforced corridor to the right and further down. Jace pulled the mechanical power lock on her weapon and let the connectors snap into place with a satisfying metallic thud. Range? Ten meters, maybe less? Perfect. Let's blow them a kiss. Uh Jace Hunter suddenly appeared in the center of the besieged corridor and leveled the relatively large rifle at her hip. A flash of stark light reflected from the drifting smoke, launching a fast-moving bolt of energy down the corridor. A half-second later, Hunter detonated it with another shot, and a savage explosion twisted and battered the bulkheads up and down the passageway. Two shadowy forms slipped across the passage, drawing a barrage of rifle fire from Hunter. At least one of the attackers fired back, but the shots were wide and impacted against the ceiling. Jace pumped lance after blinding lance of white-hot energy into the floor and walls, causing debris to eject, splinter, and scatter all over the corridor. Another figure appeared and hesitated in the open. In a split second, Hunter realized the attacker was readying another grenade. She fired another bolt down the hall just as a second attacker broke from cover. The detonation filled the hallway with fire. There was a scream followed by a burst of weapons energy. A deafening, vicious second explosion from the dropped grenade ripped a hole in the station's internal atmosphere. One of the attackers ran headlong from the conflagration, his entire body in flames. Jace ducked to one side as more weapons fire followed shouts and the sound of falling machinery. In the ensuing confusion, Hunter managed to hit two more of the attackers with bursts of lethal plasma energy. The safety systems had long since been out of commission, so every shot that missed blew another cloud of hot, razor-sharp debris off the walls and ceilings. Hunter fired another extended burst, causing several more violent explosions, and then ducked back into the records lab. Having fun? Huggins asked. Always preferred a stand-up fight. Hunter exhaled, holding the rifle muzzle straight up as regulations required. Sutherland, tell me a happy story. We're being jammed. We don't have the power to punch through the local distortion field with this equipment. Fine, Hunter sighed. She pulled a second handheld comm unit out and tapped configuration codes into it. Let's see them jam this. What is that for? You've got two of those things. Yep. This one is a VLF ultra-wideband transmitter. Takes several seconds to send a data packet, 
But unless you've got a matter-slash-antimatter reactor powering your jamming equipment, you've got no chance of modulating the signal. Who are you calling? The world's smallest invasion force. Not far away, Commander Hunter's minibots were still in formation, headed up a well-lit but empty corridor towards the research side of the station. A little red heart-shaped indicator light on Echo's forward-facing chassis snapped on. It's AC! It's AC! she shouted. She says she's in trouble and she needs help. Let me at him, Rebel growled. He revved his drivetrain, but only managed to spin his tracks. You have to wait until you're on the ground, Rebel, Butterfly said in a bigger, kid-reminding little kid tone of voice. She carefully maneuvered along her flight path. Brothers and sisters, Wave began, as we prepare to take the field of battle, let us all remember though we be awesome individuals, we are also one, and as one, we will prevail. You know it, Lunar added. Don't be scared, Butterfly, I'll protect you, Echo shouted. I'll be okay. Butterfly was picking up residual weapons fire readings. AC sent me a battle plan. I'll share it with everybody, Echo said excitedly. That's the corridor. Wave said, Shaka, dudes and dudettes, let's carve the chop. To a spectator, what happened next would have looked for all the world like a 1950s monster film with little model trucks and tanks attacking a guy in a hairy rubber suit. Butterfly performed a textbook assault airlift maneuver, descending at maximum safe speed and placing Rebel in the center of the corridor. She detached and reeled in her magnetic harness as she pitched forward, using her main rotors to accelerate up the battlefield. Rebel's powerful quad drives kicked in, and the chunky little tank rolled towards the action, climbing over small pieces of debris effortlessly. Wave pulled up along Rebel's right flank and collapsed his bay ramp. Echo's light bars began rotating red emergency lights as she backed down the ramp to the corridor floor. As soon as all four of her wheels were on the ground, she swerved to one side with a chirp of her tires and accelerated, following Butterfly's lead. Lunar banked into a position about six feet above Rebel and Wave. I've got targets! Establishing telemetry and battle space data link. Acknowledge. Rebel acknowledges. Wave acknowledges. Echo here. I read you, Lunar. I see it, Lunar, Butterfly said. One of the intruders had fallen back to swap energy packs in his rifle. He saw the little vehicles first. As usual, there was a moment of hesitation and amusement as he saw a tank in the distance roughly the size of a thick encyclopedia climbing slowly over a pile of broken conduits and rolling ponderously down the other side. That hesitation was what the minibots always counted on as it gave them time to close range. Before he knew what was going on, a tiny helicopter burst from the drifting smoke and accelerated up the corridor right at his head. The shadowy intruder stumbled back as Butterfly whizzed past. By the time he had regained his feet, the sound of buzzing emergency horns, chattery sirens, and chirping alert signals filled the corridor. He looked down to find a lights-rotating ambulance bumping into his ankles. Emergency! Emergency! Clear the road! Clear the road! Finally, a 110-decibel compressor-charged banger siren sounded, which was enough to drive the intruder back several yards. Echo accelerated down the hall, swerving around the wreckage of the battle, lights spinning. He turned, and Luna was hovering six inches from his nose. A targeting laser appeared right between the intruder's eyebrows. My name is Luna, and you are my prisoner. Chapter 33 you can tell me now, or we'll just pull the plans from the Dunkirk's memory banks. It's only a matter of time, Colonel. Give it up and tell me what's going on between you and Hughes. Atwell continued to stare at the ceiling. The only evidence the man was even alive was his open eyes. The brig cell's invisible force field hummed. What are you protecting at Raleo? That got the reaction Hunter presumed it might. Atwell turned his head and harumphed. You're so far behind at this point, Captain. Your only hope is to run for home and kiss your loved ones goodbye. Big words from a man in a cell, Colonel. What we discovered out there will change the very nature of reality itself. Your meaningless attempts to understand what is happening here do not concern us in the slightest. And who is us, Colonel? I see a lot of Skywatch ships. I see an interdiction formation, and I see a big gun with no power system hooked up yet. If I didn't know better, 
I'd start wondering if this isn't all an elaborate bluff just like your little toy. Atwell got to his feet silently and walked right up to the force field to stare Hunter down. You were warned. You were warned again. You chose to come here knowing full well things were not as they appeared. I tried to save you. The Admiral ordered me to save you. But you didn't listen. And now you and your crew are going to die. You speak of time, Captain. You have no idea how little of it you have left. If you're so certain of yourself, Colonel, then why the constant stream of riddles? Speak plainly for a change. What is going on at Raleo? Atwell hesitated, apparently believing he was going to be able to get Hunter to blink. Finally, he turned and went back to his mattressless bunk and sat down. The man looked exhausted, as if he hadn't slept in days. Perhaps he hadn't, but Hunter had to have answers. The Dunkirk detected a structure on the surface of Raleo too. That planet is a ball of lava and thousand-degree rocks, Colonel. Any structure down there would melt into ashes in a matter of minutes, no matter what it was made out of. The structure we found is sixty million years old. Hunter didn't answer right away. Then how... How indeed, Captain. When the obelisk was built, the Raleo system didn't exist. Are you getting the picture now? Are you willing to put aside your cowboy hat and six-shooter and allow your tiny mind to glimpse the true destiny of humanity? Let's say you're right, and the structure you found doesn't make any logical sense. What does that have to do with Admiral Hughes and the crew of the Dunkirk? Our first readings didn't make any sense. They weren't scientifically meaningful. They couldn't be explained by anyone aboard, even our archaeological team. But that was just our first attempt. After a series of experiments, we determined the laws of physics were breaking down the closer our instruments got to the obelisk. Finally, we managed to complete a molecular analysis of the planet's surface around the object and discovered five completely new elements. But that's not what made us take the next step. You sent people down there. Our scientists had to know. Even our non-technical command staff knew something huge was right under our feet. So we concocted a likely story and came back out here with our cargo bays filled with specialized equipment. We have observed the impossible, Captain. What happened next cannot be explained by any science known to man. What are we talking about here, Colonel? You found El Dorado? Another dimension? Gateways? What? Our astrophysicist calls it quantum reflection. It's as good a term as any because our best efforts to catalog and replicate our experiments have all failed. Every time we test the zone around the obelisk, we get another set of readings that have nothing to do with the previous set. None of it makes any sense. And all this data is on the Dunkirk. Atwell nodded wearily. One thing we did find is that isotopes don't decay here. They strengthen. So instead of going from unstable to stable in one direction, they go from unstable to more unstable in the other. Our theory is there is something affecting matter and energy that causes quantum effects to form feedback loops that build up unstable energy. The only thing keeping it from ripping the planet to pieces is the effects lose energy the further they get from the obelisk, but that's not going to last. Why is that? Because the nature of these effects mean they build on each other, Captain. The longer that object stays in our space, the more powerful it gets. Eventually, it will start to affect Raleo 2 itself, and then it will start affecting the Raleo primary. If it gets a hold of that star's energy, we theorize it will go hypercritical in a matter of hours. We have no idea what will happen next. Then why don't we just destroy it? Still thinking with your guns, eh, Captain? This is why we don't share important discoveries with average people. I took an oath, Colonel, and so did you. If that thing is a threat to human populations, I'm going to fly out there and punch its ticket. That's my duty as a Skywatch captain. You can't destroy it any more than we could. That thing would eat your weapons like candy and spit them right back at you. That's assuming whatever is on the other side of that obelisk doesn't simply kill you first. What do you mean, other side? We got a voice transmission before we called in reinforcements. The commanders of those ships have all been apprised of the possible dangers. We still haven't been able to translate it. The only thing our linguistics banks came up with 
was there are apparently over a thousand voices in the message, all overlapping in the same data stream. There's an intelligence involved here? Far beyond our own, Captain. We could be facing an invasion or any of a hundred other larger threats. Well, there's one certainty in all this, Colonel. The answers are aboard your ship, and one way or another I'm going to get at them. Hunter started for the exit. Watch yourself, hotshot. Hunter paused at the exit as Atwell raised his voice. The Dunkirk was parked in orbit over that obelisk for days before we were able to evacuate the crew. Hunter left the brig and hurried for the flight deck. We have no idea what's left aboard. Atwell's voice echoed throughout the detention section as Hunter climbed into the magneto lift. Chapter 34. New contact bearing zero mark zero. Collision alarm. The sudden shouts from the Fury's tactical officers startled everyone on the bridge. One moment everything was functioning smoothly and the next they were surrounded by screaming nightmares. Senior Lieutenant Sabrina Mallory swiveled in the bridge command chair. Reflex batteries forward. Fire. Point blank. A frigate-class vessel hurtled at full power towards the Fury's bridge, its engines glowing red-hot through their cowlings and hull plating. A moment later, the enormous strike cruiser's forward-point defense weapons exploded to life, filling space with a terrifying yellow-white fusillade. Sixty shots per second poured from each battery. The overloaded plasma energy produced a huge cloud of residual particles in the cubic mile of space forward of the Perseus flagship. Dozens of bolts ripped into the ablative nose armor of the smaller ship, tearing huge spinning chunks off and throwing them into space in its wake. Dust and electrical arcs formed an enormous static shockwave forward of the vessel as its atmosphere ignited against the suddenly intense surface heat of the rapidly disintegrating hull structure. A secondary explosion shook the ship's inner decks, but still it came, streaming atmosphere and burning debris. The boot of the guards impacted Fury's port armor, and the bridge crew fought to retain consciousness as the entire vessel pitched a good thirty-five degrees to starboard. The auto-alert systems activated, and decompression alarms began to sound. What the hell was that? Mallory barked. Weapons fire port! Someone shouted in response. Veer us off, pilot. All engines back full. Give me a port reversing turn. All battle screens to maximum power. Too late. For only a moment, the fireball trailing frigate filled the screen, and then another incredible blast plunged the Fury Bridge into complete darkness. Auto alarm! Fury's been hit! shouted the weapons officer on the bridge of DSS Spruance. I have weapons fire bearing 105. The mighty cruiser's captain calmly shifted into action. Sound fleet-wide general quarters, Ensign. Helm, bring us about. Course 77, Mark 15. All ahead, one half power. Comms, bring us up on the JA. Patch us in as 0 Juliet 4. Signal all ships. Code 00 Black. I say again, Code 00 Black. Engage battle conference on this channel and stand by for strike operations. The communications officer responded with precision efficiency as he performed five tasks at once. Affirmative, Captain. Coding your message. Encrypted lost channels opened across space in all directions. The jangling, clear channel alert tone sounded. All stations, this is Spruance Force Command on Emergency Channel. Acknowledge code 00 Black and report alert status to signal station 0 Juliet 4. Standing by. Affirmative, Spruance. This is Revenge, acknowledging strike alert at time out 30 mark. Vessel at your command. Constellation acknowledges. Minstrel is at point 5, station 8 Juliet 4, standing by. DSS Jefferson acknowledging. Battle alert engaged. Rhode Island at your command, sir. Exeter acknowledges. DSS Ajax has the point, Spruance. Acknowledge battle stations code 00 Black, standing by. Comms, raise the fury as soon as you are able. Tactical, report all contacts. A chorus of eyes responded, one for each of the Spruance skipper's commands. Lieutenant Commander Francis Teller swiveled back to examine the main view screen. An atmosphere-fueled fire was burning on Fury's dorsal section just aft of the bridge. Teller's jaw tightened. He knew what that damage meant. CIC, I want an origin point and a firing solution for that weapon in ten seconds. 
the Perseus task force went from station-keeping to a perfectly choreographed swirl of motion all at once. Three destroyers and three frigates moved to screen their flagship from further weapons fire, while the two heavier cruisers pounded away with their active scanners, combing nearby space for the source of the weapons fire. New contact, 88 Mark V, on a collision course with the Rhode Island. The tactical officer on the Spruance Bridge jumped to his feet. This doesn't make any sense. Where the hell are they coming from? This time, the command data net gave seven vessels a track on the suicide attacker all at once. The Exeter, Constellation, and Jefferson opened up first, firing hypervelocity point defense missiles from their efficient and deadly rotary mounts at the inbound target. Then the Rhode Island's energy batteries joined in. In a matter of seconds, 80 missiles were in space and screaming towards the attacking starship. Jamming signals managed to confound some of their, their weapons locks, but did nothing to protect the attacker from DSS revenge. The Fury's escort cruiser calmly pivoted all four of her heavy weapons mounts to bear on the diving enemy frigate and opened up with a hurricane of proximity blasts. Ten megaton explosions shocked and pounded space for a thousand cubic miles around the inbound track of the wildly swerving vessel as the point defense missiles began to impact. A savage storm of incredible destructive energy streamed through space and finally faded. There was no wreckage. CIC, talk to me, Teller shouted. I want to know who is shooting at us and I want to know now. I have an indeterminate series of targets at extreme range, sir, but I can't vouch for any of this data. Nothing on my screen makes any sense. Blasted, Ensign. I don't want to hear about your theories. Give me something to point my guns at. If they can target us, we can damn well target them. That's the problem, sir. We can't lock up any of this. Every time we match bearings, the waveform changes. The tactical officer wore a frantic expression. That's impossible, the pilot shouted. How the hell can a ship change its composition and EM signature? Incoming! The bridge of the Spruance buckled and shuddered as the lights flickered ominously. A thundering explosion rumbled through the huge vessel's interior decks. Overload your forward screens, tactical! Teller shouted. The cruiser's shields glowed with excess energy. Another gigantic blast pounded the vessel's port side, and the bridge crew pulled themselves back upright in their shock harnesses. CIC, report. Sir, I can't give you what I don't have. Then give me a direction and range, anything. Acknowledged, Bridge. Our best guess is... New contact 05 by 1, range point 1, collision course. This time, Minstrel and Ajax banked in pursuit of the suicide ship. That's not a frigate this time, the Ajax signals officer warned. The angle is closing too fast. Veer off, Constellation, veer off. The Minstrel angrily launched a full spread of track-on signature ship-killer missiles, all 16 warheads managed an instant waveform lock on their target, but their overtake time was plus five impact, too late to save their fleet mate. Kill that ship now, Teller shouted, jumping to his feet. A full-size war destroyer hurtled towards the evading constellation. Explosions bracketed her hull and debris started to trail, but destroying a ship this size was going to take time, and the range was closing too fast. Constellation evasive, Teller screamed. Out of nowhere, a full-power war shot speared the oncoming suicide destroyer amidships. A blinding explosion shook the very fabric of space as two more shots blasted hundred-foot breach points in the spinning vessel's disintegrating hull. DSS Fury's other two main batteries swiveled silently and opened fire. Shot four blasted the destroyer's engines into a cloud of spinning debris, fire, and trailing radiation. Shot five missed. Shot six detonated across her ventral hull, igniting a screaming, shrapnel-ejecting hypernova before the seventh shot impaled her fusion assembly. An impossibly bright explosion flared to life briefly and then vanished, leaving a ghostly afterimage, a long trail of radioactive fuel and an expanding wake of fast-moving debris. The scene on every Perseus bridge was the same. It wasn't often they got to see their flagship unload. When she did, it was a sobering event. Where a 70 ton vessel had once been, there wasn't a single piece of wreckage larger than a coffee can. Spruance, report! Come in, Spruance! Teller finally looked down from the scene of utter destruction on his bridge viewscreen and activated the intership. 
Good to hear a friendly voice, Fury. We have multiple targets on the board. Firing solutions are imminent. What is your status? We're hurt, but we're still in the fight. Transfer Force Command to 1 Juliet 4 and prepare to re-establish an attack posture. Acknowledge. Affirmative. Fury has the ball. Spruance shifting to force escort on 0 Juliet 4. Vessel at your command, ma'am. They're gone, sir! Teller turned back to his screen. The tactical officer was right. All their previous tracks were gone. There was nothing in space except the nine ships of the task force. What the hell am I looking at, Ensign? I don't know, sir. One second they were there, the next they were gone. Chapter 35 Are you certain, Argent? Affirmative, Captain. They've been actively targeted for the last two minutes, forty seconds. And no response at all? Negative. No change in aspect, no emissions. That ship is dead in space, Honora replied. Confirmed and rechecked, Captain. Shall we run a life signs check? Hunter sat at the pilot's controls aboard his gunship. T-Hawk 8 was parked 300 yards off the Dunkirk starboard quarter. At the navigator and tactical station sat Zoni and Yili. Behind them stood 11 armored marines. They were ready to commandeer the renegade Skywatch vessel and return it to fleet control. Go, Argent. Let's find out what we're dealing with here. Scanning. There's no running lights either, Skipper, Moo said. I don't think anyone's home. This fits in nicely with Atwell's story, Hunter muttered. I got the distinct impression Hughes marooned the crew somewhere. Perhaps they're on Barker's asteroid manning that ground station. Or maybe they're on Barker's asteroid as prisoners, Yili offered. With all due respect to the Admiral, it sounds like the man has gone right around the bend. T-Hawk 8, Argent. Go ahead, XO. No life signs aboard the Dunkirk. Goodness, Zoni whispered. What did he do? Kill the crew? Hunter blurted out. Moo winced. There are 170 men and women on that ship. Not anymore, Skipper, Honora replied. No life signs, no bodies, no nothing. That ship is completely abandoned. Does it have an atmosphere? Is life support functional? We've got signs that reserve power systems are operating at a greatly reduced power level. Mains are offline. No reactor signatures or heat signatures in her plants. No engine trail either. Sir? Hold on, XO. Hunter muted the intership. What she just said doesn't make any sense. If all that is true, how did the Dunkirk get here? That, engineer, is a very good question. Hunter replied as he opened the channel to the Argent again. XO, keep us on scanners. We're going to board her as planned. Hunter out. The captain closed the channel and set the ship on auto approach. All right, let's suit up. Make sure we've got hatch clamps and everyone's weapons are charged and ready. Neek, take us to five meters. Engines at station keeping. Channels open. Affirmative. T-Hawk 8 on approach. The small company turned their equipment over and over, snapping, opening and closing the control mechanisms, checking and rechecking the indicator readouts. Hunter, Zoni and Yili all donned their own power armor and pressurized their tack suits. Engage Triple S. There may not be an atmosphere over there. Hunter said. Affirmative. Watch your pressure and temperature differentials and don't touch any surfaces without your anti-static and heat fields up. Any exposed metal over there could be 200 below zero. We don't want your gloves or precision surfaces to freeze and get stuck, Moo added. The Marines all nodded while Zoni worked through their comms checks. T-Hawk 8 to Argent. Boarding party in space. Meanwhile, on the bridge of the Argent, everyone's attention was riveted on the real-time video feeds from the boarding party's helmet-mounted cameras. It wasn't often a commanding officer led a spacewalk, and many of the younger crew members were in a combined state of utter shock and complete disbelief as they saw Jason Hunter float out the airlock of the gunship and maneuver his tack suit in the direction of the Dunkirk's much larger external hatch. Then the impossible happened. What did I just see? Honora said with an urgent tone in her voice. The rest of the bridge crew went back to their instruments, trying for all the world to decipher the data that would explain how the Dunkirk faded away and then reappeared. Report! Ma'am, these readings don't make any sense. One second she's there, the next she's gone. Argent to boarding party. Nothing happened. Commander Doverly whirled on her comms officer with a look that demanded answers. 
Channel is open, ma'am, and you are five by five. Doverly to Hunter, acknowledge. The Dunkirk faded and then reappeared again. This is impossible. Mass can't just vanish like this, the tactical officer exclaimed. It's like that ship is changing its atomic structure moment by moment. Are we in contact with the boarding party or not? We're transmitting. They must be hearing us. The young ensign switched her console over to a diagnostic cycle. Every indicator showed green. No fault in the equipment, ma'am. We're broadcasting in the clear on all frequencies. Jason! Meanwhile, Captain Hunter was confidently listening to Commander Doverly's calm advice on how to open the Dunkirk's external airlock. One by one, four Argent officers and ten Marines boarded the abandoned cruiser. Ten seconds later, the Dunkirk vanished from the Argent's instruments. This time, she didn't reappear. Chapter 36 Jace Hunter heard a commotion outside the records lab. Weapons fire preceded the sounds of small engines and shouting. Then, a banging sound. She checked her weapon and leaned far enough into the mangled doorway to see what was going on. The intruders appeared to be engaged with an enemy behind them. Flashes of more weapons fire strobed in the hallway. A few seconds later, Echo came barreling up the corridor, emergency lights in full operation and sirens blaring. Butterfly was escorting her from a few feet overhead. AC! AC! There's bad guys back there! Echo screamed through the door and skidded sideways to a halt. Butterfly arrived a moment later and pivoted in the air, apparently ready for more action. Are they hurt? Are they hurt? They're hurt! she exclaimed. Echo, we have to help them. Okay, Echo said, revving up alongside Lieutenant Sutherland. Cliver's first, Jace said. He had the worst injuries. We didn't have the equipment to stabilize him. Acknowledged, Echo said as she swerved around and parked by the wounded man's shoulder. Her wheels locked and she deployed her sensors over his face and chest. An indicator panel rose from her dorsal chassis and began to display the wounded officer's vital signs. A small clamp reached out and fastened itself around his arm. A pressure-operated intravenous system went into operation and began to restore blood volume, fresh plasma, and oxygen levels. Almost immediately, his condition improved. Lieutenant Sutherland stared in blatant disbelief. She thought the words mobile trauma unit were just talk. But here she was. A robot with the apparent personality and voice of a girl not yet out of elementary school treating her wounded comrade like a veteran battlefield medic. Don't worry, he's going to be okay, Echo said, her little light bars still going. He's just tired because he got hurt. Sutherland couldn't help but smile. Echo sounded like she was on a weekend excursion to the park to fly kites. Butterfly had landed nearby and was busy monitoring the local area communications channels. Little indicator lights blinked all around the lower edge of her airframe. Our transmissions and reception are still being jammed, AC, she said. I can't hear Rebel, Wave, or Luna. We've got to find that jamming unit, Hunter said. Until we put it out of commission, we'll never be able to re-establish communications with the Fury. What about the rest of the minibots? Huggins replied. They can't take on the entire enemy force alone— can that VLF unit communicate with the task force net? Jace shook her head. Range is too short. We can get simple messages from one side of the station to another, but we don't have the power to transmit very far beyond that. Next time, we'll just have to remember to bring more army with us. That's affirmative, Exo, Hunter said. But you know, there's still one thing we can try. She pulled out the VLF transmitter again. Butterfly... Did you see any airlock facilities on Deck 5 on the way over here? Yes, ma'am, the little helicopter replied. Yeah, Echo agreed. There's an emergency one right by the corner at the end of that hall. Lunar, this is AC. Can you hear me? The progress bar on the unit moved gradually from one side of the screen to the other as the antenna converted the message to data and slowly transmitted it across the limited bandwidth available. Seconds passed. A light appeared on the unit and another progress bar crawled across. This is Lunar, standing by. Commander Hunter keyed her message into the unit manually, using Lunar's op codes instead of his voice interface. After several dozen keystrokes, she hit the enable key and closed the channel. What's the plan, Skipper? 
I planted a message for the task force in Luna's memory. He's going to open the airlock and fly it out to the Fury Courier style. Yay, Lunar gets to go to space, Echo cheered. I love it when he talks about going to space. Then all we have to do is hold out for reinforcements, Huggins said. And hope Rebel and Wave don't get vaporized in the meantime, Hunter replied.